Hello guys, this is Good Like, and we're back to Let's Code. Since we're basically done with the sprint tests, I decided it's about time to get some random crap done, like updating dependencies. As you can see, that is not a good idea. <laughs> Alright, so I, I, yeah, I'm just, try to braid your idle to five. Well, it almost worked, except, as you can see, there's problems. First of all, I changed to this uh, method. Instead of doing one string line, I changed to group name version, because that's the way that Maven repository does it, and it's just easier to copy from there to here than it is, you know, to if I want to add something new, for example. So I, I don't want to always have to change it around. So I'm sticking to this modus operandi. Anyway, I updated all the versions, which wasn't that many. But uh, one thing that I also decided to do is update Gradle to 5.3. Boy, <laughs> that's not a good idea. Well, specifically upgrading to Gradle 5 wasn't that big of a deal in of itself. But I also rated the Shadow Jar plugin because it's for Gradle 5. That that was one of the main reasons I wanted to upgrade Gradle in the first place, because there's a Shadow Jar plugin up upgrade that's for Gradle 5, and I wanted that. Unfortunately, in their infinite wisdom, they forbid lower versions of Gradle from using Shadow Jar of the higher version. So if you use Shadow Jar 5.0.0, you can't use Gradle 4 or anything below that. You have to use Gradle 5 or higher. You might say, oh, come on, come on, good like, you're, you graded it to 5.3, didn't you? So what's the big deal? What could possibly go wrong? Let me tell you what goes wrong. Okay, like, okay, so you think, oh, yeah, it's very nice, very nice. Let's see. Okay, so right now, as you can see, I'm using local Gradle distribution 5.3. Let's see our Gradle wrapper. Gradle wrapper uses 5.3 all. Uh, my Gradle task is set to 5.3 in wrapper, which is now no longer a separate task, but just a wrapper. What's going to happen if we set this, the original setup? I wonder. Let's see what happens. Hmm. I wonder what will happen. Just, 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 just imagine what could possibly go wrong in all of this. Oh no! Shadow supports Gradle 5.0 plus only. Please, what the fuck? I, right, you know, you know, this is just like, why? Why does this happen? Well, okay, okay, okay. So, let me show you what is actually happening by, first of all, I'm going to, uh, stop all daemons in Gradle. Which is taking a long time for some reason, motherfucker. Alright, no more Gradle daemons are running. So now we can safely get rid of Gradle here, and I'll go ahead and get rid of Gradle. Right, I'm deleting Gradle from my user catalog, which is a gigabyte of files. Hopefully none of them are going to linger. It shouldn't be, because we stopped our daemons. This thing isn't running Gradle right now, so everything is nice and dandy. Yeah, some files are locked, you know, it, it happens. Just in case, I'm going to close IntelliJ IDEA and do it again. Okay, now I've successfully purged all Gradle files from my computer. What happens if I press refresh? Let's see. Oh, what's this? You're downloading Gradle 4.10, even though I clearly state 5.3, and the properties also state 5.3, IntelliJ IDEA and its infinite wisdom and intelligence downloads 4.10 and runs 4.10. Even as you could see, that was that was the same thing was happening even when I was setting local distribution, so it knows for a fact there is Gradle 5.3 somewhere on the computer. But it's going to download 4.10 and it's going to try to build with 4.10. And it's going to fail because Shadow Jar expects Gradle 5.0 only. So the only workaround until IntelliJ IDEA changed their hard-coded 
4.10 version is to use 5.3 locally or use uh, the default Gradle wrapper, which actually works. By the way, yes. But then it will be in the Gradle folder, which will be in the middle of my project, messing up my project structure, which I don't want. So I'm using local instead, and that's why the comment here is just, it'll, it'll be here until the version update. Though honestly, I probably shouldn't remove it, because, you know, IntelliJ Idea has a shitty pricing scheme. They went to a more subscription-based model. Originally, they, they wanted to make it so that you pay monthly, and uh, you don't own jack shit. You stop paying, you stop using their software. And every single programmer in the world just gave them the middle finger, so they made uh, a concession, and instead of doing that, you do get to use a year-old version. Someone could still say, well, fuck that shit, I don't want that fucking crap, that's a crappy scheme, and I understand. Personally, I think it's within, like, that tiny edge of acceptability, like, like, they're on that thin line that slightly more to the wrong side and I, I'd probably never use IntelliJ IDEA ever again. But because they're on... They, they didn't do... They, they just remained on that edge, so uh, I'm fine with using it, but I can understand that other people may be not fine with using it. Some people probably don't even give a shit about this fucking software. What can I say? I will, in fact, uh, I'll leave this comment here. I'll, I might change it to reflect it more that, hey, if you use updated version, then you can use non-local Cradle. But wait, there's more. OKHTTP OK, internal changes. So what happened to OKHTTP? OK, Not much. I updated from, uh, I believe, where is it? Where are you? There it is. From 3.12 to 3.14. Don't look at this. This wasn't supposed to be with this commit. It was supposed to come with the other commit, but... Oh. Mistakes were made. Uh, I changed this because mattress was uh, deprecated. So another thing that I noticed was that I was using Mokito all, which was severely outdated. It was 2.02 .02 beta or something. And as you can see, we are far advanced from that point. So that's that's fixed. Uh, but the other thing that I changed, I believe, was that I couldn't no longer test using this method because OKHTP OK, is rewriting their internal shit. They're also starting to use Kotlet, uh, also known as Kotlin. The reason I call it Kotlet, because there's like a dish called uh, like that in our country, and probably other countries as well, uh, probably, I don't know, there's probably a better English name, but I like Kotlet, because it's basically just uh, grounded meat put into like this spherical flat and spherical shape and then cooked obviously so um yeah that that that's my opinion of the language it's very accurate so that's why i call it kotlet of course there's no really wrong languages there's just horrible ways to write in said languages which somehow against all odds are the official ways to write in most languages i've yet to find a language that you know, comes out and says, do things in a sensible way. No, instead, let's just do some random bullshit that no one can understand or read <laughs> until they fucking commit themselves to the monastery of their language where they have to learn everything. Fuck that. I'm just going to stick with plain old Java because... I mean, like I said, I, I don't give a shit. All the languages are the same to me, honestly. They're writing internal shit, so uh, instance no longer has the put method. Doesn't have a put method anymore because of some changes. I, I'm not going to go into it, but the idea is now that uh, you can get the real connection pool, which is something you need in order to use the put method. Unfortunately, the put method is package private, so I had to put this class in a proprietary package. But that's what you get when you don't want to use reflection. I don't want to use reflection. I'd rather just use these fancy schmancy tricks instead. They're just about as effective for these type of cases, but they're much better in terms of compilation errors. If I use reflection originally here, 
I wouldn't have known that something broke until I ran the tests, and I could have just not done that for some reason, who knows. Anyway, that also wasn't the last thing. You may have noticed that the uh, font is different. That's because somehow or other I managed to break space behavior on my previous font, which was called just monospaced. I can't even select it anymore, but the point was that it wasn't monospaced. It was doing something along the lines of, let's say, mm, all right, this is exactly the class that actually broke. So imagine if these two spaces didn't exist in the view. So this was aligned from here as well as everything else. But the amount of spaces in here would match the amount of characters in here. So it, it wasn't that the characters were misaligned, but the font of the space was just slightly too small, causing everything to misalign here. That's the insanity that we're dealing with here. So I changed the font and now, well, I don't know, it, it looks fine. I gotten used to it by now, so I'm good. Anyway, after I dealt with the seven plagues, I decided to finally get to work on uh, more stuff. I had done a lot of this uh, already before the seven plagues have fucking started to attack me, but uh, the main idea was that I wanted to extract the browsing logic, because it's quite a big logical uh, clump inside main about uh, how to launch a browser, how to launch in clipboard, or copy to clipboard, if, and how to make it so that you use a browser first, then clipboard, and then just report something's bad. And I decided to go all out. <laughs> just, just no holds barred. Just the absolute maximum amount of effort you could put in into designing this mad, mad API that you could possibly do. So that's what I did. Yeah, obviously I moved the, the main class to separate package because I was going to extract some class for it, so it wasn't a good idea to keep it in the original package. Create an interface called Link Launcher. It encapsulates the logic behind launching some sort of an URL. We have a method is available, which basically tells you is this Link Launcher even capable of launching anything? Mind you, it can still fail even if it's available, but it it will if we definitely know that it's going to fail, it will give you that it's not available. Because we can know sometimes, but not always. So launches just obviously do whatever the launcher does. In the case of a browser, it just opens a browser window. In case of a clipboard, it will copy it to the clipboard. And we have a listener. Listener, which is another interface, link launcher listener, which we can add as many listeners as we want. And uh, whenever something happens, when we launch an URL, the listener will get an event. And there's a bunch of different type of events. On success, so we launch it. On unsupported is the case where we try to launch uh, an URL on a launcher that is not available that would return false what is available. And suddenly unsupported is uh, just one type of exception that's thrown when, uh, even though we think it's supported, when we actually try to launch it, it turns out it's not supported for some reason or another. On missing permission is a special type of error that relates to security exception. Issue with URL is, well, as it says, if it can't for some reason open it in the browser because there's something wrong with the URL. And on other error is just literally any other possible exception that means errors that are actual errors, uh, you know, application errors, Java errors would still be propagated. Only exceptions would be caught. This is not the first iteration of this API. I went through quite a few versions, but I didn't commit them over the days because I was kind of hacking away at it because I didn't know what I wanted to do and I didn't want to put it in a spike because we were dealing with uh, main anyway. So I didn't care as much. So this is one of those cases where, you know, I didn't do TDD or anything like that at all because it's part of the UI stuff and uh, I don't care as much if, if it works or it doesn't work. It's not that important. It just needs to work, sorta. There's one more interface I need to cover, and that is the Smart Link Launcher, which can launch a URL even if one of launchers that are part of it fails. So Smart Launcher is a bunch of launchers, and 
it tries to launch with each one of them until it succeeds. Link and unsupported is the most trivial one, which is just always unsupported. And if it ever is used, it will just report an error. This is a launcher that basically is used by the smart launcher as the final step. If every other launcher fails, we just use this one instead, because why not? Then there's the two main dives. The paste is quite trivially, if it is available, it copies to a clipboard, otherwise it gives the unsupported event. Uh, it's not available if it doesn't have a clipboard inside of it, and by default, we allow a system clipboard. System clipboard is achieved over here. It's a singleton that we extract from the toolkit, basically, which is some Java AV AWT bullshit. Uh, but this is the way it works. If, if it's not headless, which is something that you pretty much have to check for all these kind of things, if you want to be safe, uh, then you get the toolkit, get the get the clipboard if something happens and we return no. By default we use that, but for testing, because I want to test this and I don't want to use the system clipboard for testing, we allow injecting it instead. So that's that's really nice. Uh, the same exact mechanism is done with browser. It's all the same. If we have a desktop, then it's available. If it's available, we browse, otherwise the event. And uh, desktop is also retrieved as a singleton via non-headless environment where it's supported and where it supports browser no less. So not just any desktop, but a desktop that definitely supports browsing, at least at, the point, at some point. Once again, we have the same setup where we can mock for tests, but we have uh, the default one using the singleton. And in both cases, the idea is really simple. Whatever variables we need, we prepare them and we browse into and, and we use them, essentially, to achieve our expected result. If nothing bad happens, we give it a success event. If something bad happens, we produce some sort of error event, based on the exception, which is thrown by this method, usually. Now, one thing to note is, originally, I had uh, quite a bigger listener, and there were no... There was every single exception had its own method, but I realized that that's not very good, because uh, it just exposes too much about the link launcher. If we want to have some other fancy ways to launch a link, that that means we're kind of fucked because uh, think about it, if we just have like really specific uh, things like browser throws IO exception. That's completely useless for every link launcher implementation that is not a browser implementation. So I needed to create a bunch of event types that were just really general but encapsulated the idea and the possible different errors. And finally, we have the smart link launcher, the absolute madman of uh, everything. Uh, it contains a bunch of launchers in itself. And what does it do? Well, it filters out all the known launchers and available launch and non-available launchers. And for the rest of them, adds itself as listener. Because we want to any listener that's added to this launcher to also apply to all the launchers inside of it so we don't have to add them to these launchers because that would be annoying but that's not all we also add the fallback listeners so for every launcher we add uh, the fallback listener and the fallback listener works like this if you have a launcher and you take the next launcher uh, whenever the first launcher has any problem that meaning it's not successful in any way we just call the fallback launcher. So the first launcher will call the second one, the second one will call the third one, and so on and so forth until the very end. At the end, having the link unsupported, which doesn't need any more fallbacks because it's the very final one. As for the mechanism of the next default launcher, uh, we use an atomic integer. Uh, just in case we want some concurrency shenanigans not to get in our way. And uh, all that we do is just update the index as follows. We basically add plus one and then we uh, mod it by the active launcher count. Active launcher count is uh, from one to size minus one. 
So size minus one is because uh, the last link on supported launcher is never actually active launcher. We never want that launcher to be used. We kind of do, but we never want it to be the default one is the real way to actually interpret it because we want to cycle between these launchers unless they're not active. And uh, we don't want to cycle into this launcher. So we had to reduce the size by one. But, of course, size could be zero, and zero is not uh, not very good to mod with. I don't think that's going to work. That's technically division by zero, so you had to reduce it to one, and there's the special case, obviously, of one. And uh, mod one will always produce, I believe, zero, I would assume. And as a result, uh, that uh, index would still be zero. And obviously launching is as trivial as getting the right launcher. And then if that launcher fails, it will call the next one, and so on and so forth. And uh, quite trivially, link launcher is available if any of the link launchers is available. Technically, is all of them, actually, except the last one. <laughs> the last one is always not available. This isn't the final version anyway, so I'm not gonna go too deeply into it. This is just extreme overkill for what we're really trying to do. I would say, like, if you were to look for how much of it was overkill and how much wasn't, I would say, let's, let's be honest here, so... Having an interface that handles this generic logic and having also implementations like Link Browser and uh, link paste is a very good idea. It makes perfect sense. You don't want to have clipboards and desktops in the same class. They do separate things. It's really a really good separation. So this is not over-engineering in the slightest bit. Another thing that isn't over-engineering is the launcher listener. You may think this is a bit ridiculous, but the actual interface, or rather the method and the idea of adding a listener, is not over-engineering. Why is that the case? Because in main, as you can see, uh, which uses all of this stuff at this point, but originally what we're doing in main is precisely that. We're not just opening the URL somehow, we're also outputting something else. And we're doing different things based on whether there's an exception or whether we succeeded. And then we might even do something else if there's exceptions. So, so the point here really is, even though it seems like you would only need a simple launching thing where you just launch the URL or not, in reality, your application will probably want to report something, maybe not on success, but definitely on failure. There could be different ways to implement it, but I think the very idea and notion isn't wrong, that you actually want to do something after succeeding or failing to do something with Browse. And again, as I will show later, there is in fact a way to do this perhaps slightly better and more simply. But uh, I stuck with this idea because it also helped me to implement the smart link uh, in a very cool way, where you just have this fallback launcher. But uh, I, I do agree that it is a little bit cumbersome. This is the point where I realized that maybe there is a better way. Maybe I don't need all of this craziness. Well, I, I probably obviously didn't need it, but I just really liked the way that it was implemented, so I did it, and I thought it would be a perfect example of over-engineering. One class I didn't touch it was the Link Launcher Listenable, which is um, a cool way to solve uh, the listeners and adding them problems. Basically, a Listenable is a Link Launcher that implements the Add Listener uh, <laughs> Add listener method and also is link launcher listener itself. All that it really does is add listeners to some, you know, synchronized list. And uh, then whenever some event happens, it goes through all of them and does that event for every single one of them. But as a result of being both of these, when you use it in a browser, you all you have to do is call the listener method from all these listenables, and it will call on all the listeners, and you don't even see the listener here. That's, I think that's really, really cool. So wh what's this better method? So the better method to be would be to return Boolean, and that's really all there is to it. The Boolean will just say, okay, if I succeed in launching, then it's true. If I fail in launching, then it's false. And in some ways, you could say that this 
practically completely alleviates the concern with launch or listener entirely because all you have to do is then you know check if it's true and false if it's true you do one thing if it's false you do the other thing and and this is where the over engineering starts kicking in and that's specifically that in practice we probably only care about the true and false let's be honest we only care usually if uh if we succeeded or we failed and we don't really care about all these specific types so these specific types of all of this this is definitely our engineering and the proof in the pudding is when you try and use it in the application what happens uh, all of these special types just defer to the same one method so whether they were there or we just had one common method that got an exception and be done with it doesn't make any difference. These methods are definitely over engineering, 100%. The rest, uh, it depends on what the requirements are, which in this case, they're technically flexible. I could have gotten away with just what I did here with this interface and do true false, I think. But at the same time, I didn't have to get away with it. I could do with keeping the uh, current status quo. So the case here is simple. We just return true if we succeed false otherwise same logic here nothing much changes but the smart form changes a lot so first of all we no longer need unsupported it's completely deleted because it's unnecessary the unsupported logic is now rolled back into here and it's here basically in this method that's that's really all that unsupported was doing actually benefits of that is for example that we don't longer have to care about the size too much this probably still doesn't handle very well the zero but i didn't actually check it because i think I, I don't know if i try i don't know if i try i've never actually tried mod zero so maybe maybe we should do it live let's do it live what happens with mod zero i think i think it's not a good idea to do mod zero anyway because it's confusing what what does what does it mean to do a mod zero but we we, we can check it Let's debug this baby up and uh, evaluate some shenanigans. There we go. Evaluate. So let's say one mod zero. Well, it is division by zero. So surprisingly, that doesn't happen. Oh, 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 I know why it doesn't happen because that wasn't the only change that I did, I think, at the time. The next thing that I did was also I removed the is available checks in the constructor which means that there will always be no there could still be zero if all of them are null so unless they're all null there will always still be but we still need to handle so yeah this case isn't handled which is very strange because we do have a test for that definitely if we look into the test here we have like null so and we definitely add the listener and then launch it. So there we go. We found a, we found a, we're doing code review. We found a special case. So do not fail when adjusting launch chair with no launchers. So the simple, simple thing that we need to do is construct a smart link launcher like this one. So smart link launcher launcher and we want to launcher next default launcher and we just want to basically assert passes which is probably not existent for some reason <laughs> boo boo assert does not throw okay then if you say so yeah, there we go. So the idea is we basically want this to happen, and I'm pretty sure that it will fail because we're going to have division by zero. It doesn't fail because we didn't run all the tests. Run this test. At least run it. There we go. Arithmetics. Arithmetic. Thick arithmetic. Well, that's easy to fix. Let's fix it live. Why not? So we just need to make sure again, once again, that this is uh, reasonable. So let's say we get to go back to the method, which was available launcher count. 
if we're going to have to use this method anyway, definitely doesn't make sense to even bother with these in the first place. See, I didn't want to trim them because, you know, that, that's cool, you know. You, you, you don't really want to do a lot of operations in the constructor. But in this case, it is kind of necessary because we kind of want to make this uh, launcher size make sense. So math max one of this. So uh, available launcher count will always be at least one for no reason, which really this isn't an available launcher count at all. This would be like, um, let's call it available, no sorry, launcher index limit. Let's call it that, because that's what it really is. It's a limit on our launcher index. All it does, it ensures that we mod by the correct amount and that we never mod by zero. And there we go. Now this no longer fails. So let's go ahead and commit this and say that I fixed division by zero. Not division, division. How often does that happen to you guys? Division by zero. How often do you just accidentally do that? Doesn't happen often to me, I tell you. Anyway, to get back to where I was, and while well, the, the, the idea was quite simple, there's, it still basically remains, because the main idea was changing this to boolean, and then we don't have to worry about uh, the entire fallback launcher mechanism, because all we have to do is launch on all the remaining launchers, which uh, is basically just take all the launchers, get to the one that we have to use and try to launch them using any match. As soon as one of them matches, we succeed and it is launched. If all of them fail, then we just report that it's unsupported, which is the original behavior. In fact, I don't believe any of the tests broke, or at least very few of them broke. I did add these tests, though, so <laughs> they weren't there before. One of the main reasons for this was because adding these tests was uh, actually too annoying to bother with in the uh, original implementation, because mocking something like this is a pain in the butt. So, whereas this, this is fucking easy. So, this could be one case for TDD, because maybe if I did TDD, I would have never even considered this convoluted mechanism. But knowing me, I would have done it anyway, just would have written the convoluted tests instead. So, maybe this is a point against TDD, because now, now I change my mind. Who knows? Who really knows? We'll never know. But what we will know is that next what I did was extract all that crap that I added to main, these methods and this stuff, and uh, put it in the main launcher listener, which really just encapsulates all that logic. There's three different types of errors. Each of them are based uh, on uh, the type, and it just prints out the error into the default <laughs> console output. <laughs> And this is the change we just did. So that is it for today. Next time, I will do what I said I would do last time. I just this time took a lot of effort due to these fucking changes bogging me down. And I really couldn't be bothered. In fact, I took a break yesterday, as you can see. But that's mostly because uh, I had a long day at work. Today I had a shorter day of work, so I, I did some work and decided to record this. Next time, we will be actually trying to write some acceptance tests and extracting some more crap from main. And once that is done, boys, uh, that will probably be the last video of the sprint. As you can see, we're on video 14. Video 15 will be technically the last one. Unless something crazy happens again with Gradle 5 or whatever. The main idea is that on 15 we'll definitely wrap up all of this. And the 16th will be also dedicated to reviewing and demonstrating what I did. Which, uh, if you've been following, which you probably haven't because these videos get no views, I think. So, uh, 
you will probably also not watch the demo and won't see it anyway. But just in case, we will show off this magnificent creation oh, that took half a year to make. And after that, we're gonna close up the series, and I will start working on it without recording videos, which hopefully will expedite everything tremendously. So, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you later.